I don't know about you, but the older I get, the less interested I am in the physical items we gift each other during the holidays. And I find myself more drawn towards the irreplaceable moments this time of year allows. Whether it's building a fire with friends and ribbing my buddy Sean about his quote unquote fire skills, or seeing the excitement on my three-year-old's face when she grasps how good it can feel to give something away rather than just receive. Of all these more ephemeral holiday treasures, there's one that I think American life tends to forget the passing of stories and wisdom from our elders. And I like to use the term elders loosely because an elder is simply someone who's gone before you, no matter their age. So today we are celebrating the holiday season by hearing from some of you, our elders who have walked the road of recovery. I wanted to know how you have brought recovery into your living spaces. Each of the responses are brief in hopes that they act as little sparks to our imaginations as we consider ways that home might become a partner instead of an opponent to our mental health. You are listening to Mental Note Podcast. I'm Ellie Pike. Hi, my name is Cara Richardson-Whiteley, and that right there is one of my best recovery tools. A cup of tea. I know, it seems really simple, but you know, when I was in the depths of binge eating disorder, I would circle around this kitchen and the kitchen I had before, just kind of seeking an answer in what might be in the cabinets. And what I learned with a, a binge eating disorder specialist therapist was to pause, be present, to feel the counters on my hands. And if I can, get a cup of tea because when I hold this cup of tea, I'm present, I'm here. I have warmth in my hands. I can feel the texture of the porcelain on my fingertips. I can smell the aroma, I feel heat. And I'm here in a moment instead of cycling waiting for another answer or I'm not going to find it. I am just coming off of one of the most challenging mental health episodes I've ever had before just disappointed with life and thinking I'd be a lot further than I am at my age, not being happy with work and and not having a good work-life balance. And just recently, I can say proudly that the clouds are lifting and I'm feeling so much better. And I I had to set a lot of boundaries and I had to create a space in my home that was just for me full of color and light. I had to start eating differently and taking my daily walks. No matter if it's raining or if the sun is shining as beautiful as it is today, I had to get out and walk and take a breath of fresh air. Um, And I feel amazing today. Hey, I'm Jen Ponton, um, and for the last year, I have been in a really acute state of trauma and healing and recovery. And it's been additionally challenging because my housing has been very unstable and unreliable. I've found the most grounding and anchoring and rooting things that I can do have been to make my space as sacred and loving and uh, reassuring as possible. The best thing that I did was finding this picture of me from when I was 10 and I had just broken my arm and I had climbed a jungle gym and I conquered that jungle gym and I stood on top with my hands on my hips and that is the kid that I know I am like that's how I know I'm on purpose when I am her so I keep this picture of her in a hot pink frame on my desk to check in and just say we've got each other we can get through this. I'm 
Make My Home a More Healing Space for Eating Disorder Recovery by making sure that I have all of the bath essentials that I need. So that includes bath bombs, beautiful flowers, lavender oil, candles, music, and the reason that that's so important to my healing is that as a recovered individual from eating disorders in my youth, my eating disorder self is integrated with my healthy self and now only acts as an alarm system when something's going wrong in my life or I feel overwhelmed or stressed. So as soon as I get that alarm, I make sure to take a very soothing bath. It's essential to my mind, body, and soul, and I'm able to fully relax and then reevaluate whatever the situation is that could possibly trigger me. For me and my journey of recovery, um, a lot of it came down to making my home environment something that wasn't triggering and allowed me to really focus on myself. I think the most difficult part about recovering at home is exactly that, that when you are in that environment, you're forced to face the things every single day. But that was the best part of recovery was then I knew I could um, get to a spot that I could be in my house and not be thrown back into my old ways. So what I had to do was get rid of certain things in my house that were triggering, covered mirrors, did certain things around the house that would allow me to just really focus on how I was feeling in that moment um, to then eventually start to incorporate everything back in but not fall into the same traps. In 2021, I created the I Face My Demons campaign where I detailed my journey with mental health and my struggles with substance and alcohol abuse. What I did is I created a song um, and this shirt's called I Face My Demons. I sold them to people online and I asked anybody who purchased a shirt or who just wanted to use the hashtag to talk about any struggle that they had or any demons that they faced. And what I did is for a seven day period, I discussed many different topics of my journey with mental health, whether it was dealing with depression and anxiety or with substance abuse. I talked about my journey and how I got through it. And what I ended up doing is creating a really cool community of folks who all use the hashtag and they, they began to share their story, sometimes opening up for the first time about their stories and then um, talking about ways that they dealt with their things and ways they got on the other end of their journey. Um, this was very hard for me to do because at that point I had never been so open and transparent about struggles, only about the good things. And this helped me to close the door on the shame and to really just be able to move forward and to be confident in my story and my recovery and just be able to just then get on the other side of it all. Something that I did to really help support my recovery was to connect with my community, my friends, my family, and give them the opportunity to show up for me by, important, asking them to show up for me. And I let them know what I was working on and they wanted to show up for me, they just didn't know exactly how. So I let them know exactly what they could do to show up for me, how they could show up. I let them know what things were helpful, maybe not so helpful. And it would have been perfect had they never said anything activating. That just isn't reality. So something also really important that I did was I learned to tolerate discomfort and I learned to be okay without having that support. And it would have been ideal to have that support, of course, and it's not always available. When I returned home from a patient treatment, I knew that one of the most challenging things that I would have to do uh, would be setting boundaries with my family. Uh, during one family meeting while in treatment, we were given a list that was titled the do's and the don'ts about talking to somebody with an eating disorder. And when I got home, I put that paper directly onto our refrigerator. And although it was challenging, it felt really, really good to finally feel safe and understood within my own home.
I lost my mom about a year ago and I got the phone call about her passing when I was at home. And then she passed in the home that I grew up in where I still frequently visit my dad. And so I had to create these spaces both in my own personal home and the home where I grew up in and to find my moments of calm. And particularly, I really created spaces to grieve in my home, to have long spaces to take extra time to do meditation or a workout, or just create these spaces where I, it was okay to allow myself to feel how I was feeling. That really allowed me to continue on through my grief and know that it's always going to be part of me. But now that I know how to grieve at home, I know how to grieve in other spaces too when I think about her, which is all the time. Two years ago, when I was in the process of transitioning to college, um, the question came up about whether I was going to get a new therapist when I moved to college or if I was going to stick with my same therapist. And it quickly became evident with how far I was going to have to travel that um, I wouldn't be able to drive to therapy every week. And so we kind of explored our options and realized that virtual therapy might be the best option. And so that is what I ended up doing. While I'm not consistently in therapy anymore, I still have the flexibility of if I need to go to therapy or something, I can send a text and I can do therapy from wherever I'm at. And that has looked like FaceTiming or Zooming for therapy sessions in my bedroom all the way to FaceTiming and doing therapy on the top of the parking garage before I had class. And so I found with virtual therapy that I really have the flexibility that I need and it makes it really sweet when I come home for the holidays and I'm able to have an in-person therapy session. I did my eating disorder recovery outpatient. Um, I was living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming at the time and I was living in a basement <laughs> with all men, including my boyfriend, who's now my husband. And the one thing that truly helped me throughout my entire journey was finding true self-care. And so what I did was I created a self-care corner, literally a corner in my room where I was able to do all things that were void of eating and sleeping and working out and were just things that helped my soul feel better, five to 10% better essential oils, aromatherapy, painting my nails, puzzles, coloring. Let me tell you, changed the entire landscape of recovery for me because I had my space to just be unapologetically myself. Highly recommend the self-care corner. Thank you for listening to Mental Note Podcast. If you're wondering what it looks like to heal at home, you may want to look into virtual programming through Eating Recovery and Pathlight at Home. Their programs fit seamlessly into your everyday life and are proven to be as effective as in-person treatment. On today's episode, you heard from Cara Richardson-Whiteley, Ashton Grooms, Jen Ponton, Jane Seltzer, Patrick Deveni, Tony Wilson, Nikki Dubois, Chris Henry, Ivy Watts, Katie Kittridge, and Jane Mattingly. Our show is brought to you by Eating Recovery and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center. If you'd like to talk to a trained therapist to see if in-person or virtual treatment is right for you, call them at 877 877- Eight five zero seven one nine nine. If you like our show, sign up for our e-newsletter and learn more about the people we interview at mentalnotepodcast.com. We'd also love it if you left us a review on iTunes. It helps others find our podcast. Mental Note is produced and hosted by me, Ellie Pike, and directed and edited by Sam Pike. Till next time.